Hi, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. Um, we're going to get started here uh, very quickly just because we have a limited amount of time and I want to make sure we have enough time to get to everything. So uh, you are here to see the sponsorship roadmap presentation and we're going to talk about selling sponsorships in virtual and hybrid events. My name is Teresa Stass and I'm the director of Green Cactus and we are a sponsorship agency that's primarily uh, works with events out of the West Coast. Um, some of the events we work with is the Oregon State Fair, Hood to Coast Relay Races, um, Country Fan Fest out of Utah, and Gilroy Garlic Festival out of California. But we also do a lot of consulting and um, teaching across the United States as well. So that's a little bit about me, and I'm going to go ahead and dive right in because, um, quite frankly, we're at a lack of time, so I want to make sure that I can get to everybody. All right, so let's get started. First, before I get too far into it, if you have questions, feel free to drop them into the chat. Um, my colleague, Justin, is uh, moderating in the chat, and he and I work very closely together. You can also email us at info at greencactus.com. And then at the end of this, if we have enough time, I will answer any of the questions live as well. So let's get started. What are we going to cover today? Well, we're going to talk about the sponsorship roadmap. What does that look like? Um, and I think right now it's it's something that we need to kind of get back to, back to the basics. When it comes to selling virtual, people think because it's virtual, it's different. When in fact, we really have to focus on the same principles as selling even live events. And then we're going to look at what that landscape looks like with sponsorships and virtual events. and not only what the landscape looks like, but things that you need to keep in mind and some advice when you're approaching those sponsors. So the sponsorship roadmap. You know, I teach a lot when it comes to sponsorships and I, I uh, speak at lots of different associations across the country about this and event professionals. We have an online course about it. And the one thing that I always want to cover is the process of sponsorships because usually that's where things start to break down is when we're missing a piece of this roadmap. So let's start with the event. Okay, we're gonna assume we have an event, we have either a live event, we have a virtual event, we have a hybrid event, but we have an event. And because we have this event, we hopefully we've got an audience, right? Well, this audience is very important to us. And let me show you how important this audience is to us and to sponsors. We asked a few a question, well, we did a survey a few years ago, and one of the questions we asked to sponsorship decision makers, so these are all people who decide about sponsorships, everywhere from national all the way to local decision makers. And we asked them, assume you are learning about an event for the very first time, and you're trying to gauge your interest in sponsoring the event. Please choose the three most important pieces of information you can expect to see in the initial introduction deck. So this is the introduction to your event. Let's say that these people don't know anything about your event. What is the number one piece of information that they want to hear? This is the number one thing they want to know about is they want to know your demographics. They want to know your audience data before they even want to know about your event itself. Because if your audience is not relative, relevant to them, then they really don't care about what the event is. So first they want your audience, then they want your event info, and then they're interested in your attendance numbers. So just keep this in mind that your audience, your demographics, that is your number one selling point. That is the lifeblood. And that brings me to the assumption and the misconception that you are selling your event when you sell sponsorships, when in fact you are actually selling access to your audience. So think of it that way. If you can figure out how to connect your audience to your sponsors, that's where the money comes in. That's where synergy happens, and that's where sponsorships grow. So demographics as event professionals, I would assume that most of you are very familiar with demographics and typically age, sex, education, those kinds of things are the very typical types of demographics. And most sponsors want to know that kind of stuff. But right now, the trend is becoming very strong in lifestyle characteristics. So the more you can find out about your audience, the better chance you have at connecting the right prospects to your audience, which will then succeed in larger sponsorship dollars. 
So a lot of people um, in the event world, this is where they break down. They go from event to prospect and they bypass this audience part completely. When in fact, you should be going from audience to prospect. You should let your audience data guide you to the right sponsor. So we don't wanna do that, okay? We wanna make sure that we're going in order. So after you have your prospects, then you're gonna go with an introduction and that's when you release your introduction deck or what I refer to as introduction deck. Now let's jump off this for just a second because I wanna address one sheet or level proposals. And this is something that comes up a lot with, um, with events and especially smaller events. And I don't wanna say that these don't work because they can work for the right um, event, right organization. So I want you to ask yourself these questions before using something like this. I want you to ask yourself, are you a nonprofit? Are you selling sponsorships for under $2,000? Is your attendance less than 1,000? And is your event a fundraising event? Now, if you answer yes to these, and this is working for you, then by far, go ahead and use what works for you. Um, if you answer no to these, and then you really shouldn't be using this, okay? You really should be using a proper sponsorship deck or, a, you know, some call it a media kit or, or um, uh, you, but that's what you should be working with. This, this doesn't work if you're trying to get large sponsorship dollars amounts. All right. So this is kind of the layout of what a introduction deck would look like. And this is kind, this is what most, um, uh, sponsors, I'm sorry, are looking for when we're working with national or large regional sponsorships. They're looking for something that falls in this kind of, this sort of format. Now, some of these pages aren't necessarily needed, and I do go into this in depth in our online course, but right now, this is just a layout of what an introduction deck might look like. So then you've got your introduction deck, and because they're so excited about your event, you want to set up an appointment so that you can do a discovery meeting. Now, you can do this virtually, you can do this on the phone, you can do it live once things start to open up. But in this discovery meeting, what are we going to do there? Well, we're going to find out what is your prospect trying to achieve, all right? What is it that they want to get out of the sponsorship? What are their sponsorship goals? Once you know this, then you can formulate a strategy for them, a marketing and promotional strategy that will help them achieve those goals that they're trying to get out of this sponsorship. You might also ask them if they can share an example of a sponsorship that they consider successful. So if they do sponsor and they have sponsored other events, you might say to them, you know, what worked for you? What didn't work for you? This will allow you to build upon that instead of having to reinvent the wheel. It also will let you avoid those pitfalls of things that didn't work for them. Then how will they measure the success of this sponsorship? That's a huge component of this because a lot of times there's a big disconnect from what the event will find it consider successful for a sponsor versus what the sponsor considers successful. So once you find out how they plan on measuring whether or not the sponsorship is successful, you can make sure that the strategy is going to hit those key points. Then the other thing to keep in mind too is to try to find out what their budget is. If they will share that with you, it will help save you a lot of time because it is a really hard when you think you're working on a strategy that's $50,000 and they think you're working on a strategy that's $5,000. So, and I have run into that. So kind of getting a gauge of where, what mindset they have for that budget would be very helpful and save you a lot of time. All right, so once you get all this information, this is when you're gonna formulate your sponsorship strategy that drives results. This is when you create your proposal and this is when you start to put in your pricing and work out what it is that you can provide to them that will help them reach those goals. So you provide that proposal to them. And here's a quick overview of what a proposal layout might look like. Um, again, in our online course, we do go through this in depth um, and also provide templates for proposals. But um, this is sort of a quick overview, just so you can take a look at it. Then we go into negotiation, and this is where we kind of decide what's gonna work for the proposal, what's not gonna work for the proposal, and that leads us to our agreement. 
And if you haven't learned it this year, um, then I'm very surprised, but this year agreements became um, crucial to um, events and to sponsors. So why do we need agreements? Well, having a sponsorship agreement can make sure that you and the sponsor are on the same page. It will make sure that both the event and the sponsor know exactly what is expected of both of them. And especially now with COVID, there's very few events and sponsorships that are that should be doing anything without an agreement so that you understand what would happen if in case of a closure or a cancellation or a postponement, because there was a lot of that going on this year. Then you're going to fulfill, you're gonna do everything that you said you would do on that contract. You're gonna have your event, which is wildly successful. And then we're going to recap. Now, why should you recap? Because a lot of events do not. When I go in and work with them, I realize that they don't do this or they send one generic sort of letter to all their sponsors. But if you do spend the time to actually do customized recaps and debriefs, it can create a huge return on your investment and continued support for your sponsorships. And it shows that you're fulfilling your obligations. It is, think of it as like your receipt of the work that you did. And then we're going to repeat. Now we've got all of this in mind. This is all very important. And yes, it might be basic, but sometimes when we find out that we haven't, we're not being as successful as we could in sponsorships, it's because we're missing one of these pieces. One of these pieces is breaking down. And um, we want to make sure that we're continuing to do this. And this is very important, especially now in the world of virtual. So let's talk a little bit about virtual events and sponsorships and what we as an agency are seeing and also some advice and um, information that we can give you about selling virtual events. So there was a report that was just released um, about a month ago or so um, and it was the virtual tech guide and they did a massive survey and gathered some very interesting information about virtual events over this last year. So here's some stats that I found to be um, really interesting. One is only 32% of live events pivoted to virtual this year. And I was a little surprised by this, although the number is actually kind of high. Um, I was surprised that it wasn't more simply because I felt like, and I don't know how you guys felt, but I felt like everybody was going virtual. Like we were all shifting to virtual. And, um, and re in reality, only 32% of live events actually pivoted to virtual and did some sort of virtual component this year. A lot of us were trying to figure out what, what the hell's going on to begin with. So a lot of people canceled or postponed um, and waited to see what was gonna happen, but 32% um, pivoted. Only 2%, okay, keep this in mind, only 2% of event professionals were able to recoup 100% of their revenue by going virtual. Okay, that's a really low number, and but it's something that you need to keep in mind um, to keep perspective here, all right? The idea that you're gonna go virtual and recoup the same amount of money that your event would make live is probably not gonna happen, all right? It's, they're two different types. We're comparing apples and oranges, all right? So that's something to keep in mind because I have a lot of, of my clients come to me wanting to go virtual with this notion and that notion is misguided. So we need to change our mindset and think of virtual as its own event. And then 70% of event professionals and able to recoup more than 25% of their annual revenue going virtual. So this just means that people are trying to figure out what virtual looks like, but they also need to realize that it's, like I said, not the same thing, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. And it doesn't mean that you can't make money from it, but you have to really understand what is the goal. And that is the one thing I ask my clients when they come to me and ask me about going virtual. What is your ultimate goal? Are you creating this virtual event for marketing so that you can keep top of mind and engage with your patrons? Are you creating it to make money or make up for lost revenue? Or are you creating this virtual event to replace a live event like a conference? We had a lot of conferences, associations went to uh, virtual conferences. So this kind of thing is really important to keep in mind. What is the goal? Because the goal may not be to recoup 100% of what you would live. And if that is your 
your goal, then you really need to manage the expectation because that, in fact, it's not the same event. So you have to rethink how you're going to approach that. Okay, so these are some things that you want to keep in mind when you are selling virtual or hybrid events. The first thing is that, like I said from the very beginning, audience data is the lifeblood of your sponsorship. You don't have to be Coachella to sell sponsorships, but you do have to understand that you're selling access to your audience. And this is the same with a virtual. It's even This is even more important, I would say, with virtual, is that you have to truly understand who your audience is. So you have to know who you're gonna target and then you'll have to share that with your sponsor because what your sponsor wants is they wanna be connected to your audience in a way where they can communicate and, and share with them and collect their collect data. So keep that in mind when you start to sell your virtual sponsorships, your hybrids, how are you going to connect your sponsors? Um, and then second, the principles of selling live event sponsorships are the same for virtual and hybrid. You must understand what your sponsor is trying to get out of the sponsorship. So you have to understand what their goals are and you have to figure out how you can help them achieve those goals, whether your event is virtual or hybrid. So slapping a logo on something might not, might not achieve what they're trying to get out of it. So you have to be more creative and think about how your virtual event can connect your sponsor to your audience. Okay, and then third, if this is the first time you've taken your event, virtual hybrid, then you're up against some unproven results, which makes things a little harder. And that's one of the things that my clients were facing a lot of is trying to sort of navigate this virtual um, landscape or this hybrid landscape and how does what does that look like? And then what do you charge for that? Um, and also that they didn't have anything to show. Like in your in your live events, you can say, well, I've consistently had 20,000 people arrive or whatever, where with this, you're really not sure exactly what's how it's all gonna turn out. So that's something to keep in mind too. And knowing that and realizing where you're coming in on that, you might adjust the way you do your sponsorships. Perhaps it's based on impressions or clicks or marketplace visits if you're doing something like Event Hubs Marketplace. You can do something along those lines so that your pricing is fair and um, it helps. It's it's more based on um, your connections to your audience, perhaps versus you know putting a logo on things. And four, make sure your production and your technology are good. I always say this at the beginning of all of this. You know, people were kind of okay with with someone, you know, playing guitar in their living room. And we were used to, um, you know, calls in, in a kitchen or something like that. But that is not the case. If people are paying to be a part of your event, if they're paying to be a part of your um your virtual or your hybrid event um, and they're participating, they're expecting at this point good production. They're expecting um, quality technology. And so these are things you want to make sure that you um, are taking seriously. So make sure you look into that and that you're picking the right programs and things that fit well for your event. And then five, you need to upgrade your marketing when it comes to this. So make sure you message how your virtual event will work and how your patron can be a part of it. I will say that this is probably the hardest thing um, that we've had to go up against when it comes to selling sponsorships is that there is a disconnect between the sponsor being able to decide um, to, to understand what it is that you're selling and how they can incorporate themselves in it. And a lot of times that's because the event person doesn't quite understand what their online event is going to really look like. So understand, know what that process is going to look like, be able to convey it to your sponsor so that they understand how they're going to be incorporated in it. And then also make sure you make it very clear to your patrons how they are participating and how they can be a part of it. So um, as I wrap up, I just want to let you guys know that um, my new book, Sell Your Event, is on sale. It's on sale at Amazon, Barnes & Noble. And we also have a bundle pack that comes along with the workbook, which you can um, get at sellyouryeventbook.com. And I am going to switch over here live, hopefully. Here we go. 
Can you guys see me? Okay. Um, if you have any questions, now is the time. I'm happy to answer anything live for you. All right. Well, this doesn't look like we have a lot of questions. <laughs> Well, thank you guys so much. Um, I really appreciate it. And I, um, if you do have questions or at any other time, feel free to drop us an email and I will chat with everybody later. Thanks so much, guys.